Well, everybody, this is going to be a fun episode today. We get to learn about a lot of things as it relates to micro farming. Welcome, Galena, to the Flower Podcast. Thanks, Scott. I'm super happy to be here. I'm excited for this. Well, I I always find that I am learning really cool things from from you, from your Instagram feed. And I know sometimes we have really big farms on here that have many, many acres. And then sometimes I feel like it's really important to hone in on the fact that you can make a living or you can be profitable on a small piece of property. And, and I feel like too, if you're a florist and you may only have you know, a backyard and you want to grow some flowers for yourself, you can do that too. And so that's why I feel like episodes like this are, are super important. So, um, I'm really thrilled to have you here today. Yeah. Thank you. And I, you know, we always have to start at the beginning. So how did you fall in love with flower farming? So it actually started for two reasons. I didn't grow up with any farming or growing background. Um, my parents had two and a half acres. It was basically in the woods, you know, not much grew in like total shade. So we'd always like try some veggies, but you know, it was pretty sporadic. So I didn't really have any background in this at all, but my husband and I had the opportunity to go to England for three months in 2017. It was kind of a combo of remote work and where we were in life. And I just absolutely fell in love with how the English take the tiniest of spaces and they just create gardens out of them. And to me, it was totally different from my experience with America. Like this might be different in different parts of the country, but from where I am in the Pacific Northwest, it's usually just, you know, lawns and low maintenance shrubbery. There's not a lot of effort made, especially like if you have really small yards. So that just made me want to do the same. And I actually wanted to just move to England, but you know, that wasn't really possible. So I was like, well, if I can't have, if I can't move there, I'm going to come back and I'm going to create that. So we then came home, we bought a house and I started gardening, but it was mostly veggies and berries. Like that was my original goal. I just wanted to grow a lot of berries and food. And the only flowers I grew were roses which okay. were the one flat, like that's my gateway plant into flowers were roses. Um, I've always loved roses. It was something I got from my mom because, you know, we did have some rose bushes. So I just started collecting them. And then in late 2018, I got pregnant with my fourth child and I got not to be like depressing, but I got absolutely slammed with some horrible uh, prenatal depression. <laughs> mm. It was really bad. And it kind of just multiplied in a horrific way, chronic depression that I had had since I was 14. So it kind of just took all of that and it just mm. exploded into something that was just absolutely miserable, but not to get in down into the weeds about that. Um, somehow in that process. And after my son was born, I stumbled across Florette as we all have. And this spark of interest was born in my brain to grow flowers. And like, I really didn't know what any of them were. Like, I couldn't have told you what a zinnia was. Like, did not even know that name. So I knew what tulips and roses were. And that was like about it. But if I get interested in a topic, I really, really dive in. I'm low key obsessive, maybe high key obsessive about <laughs> topics that. I want to know about. So that little spark was born and I started to read everything I could on it. So I found Charles Doubting on YouTube and that's what got me into no-till, which is actually how I built my farm. I've never tilled anything. I bought Florette's books. I bought so many books. I read them all. My dining room became a seed starting room, like for real, like it was just full of lights and seeds. And my husband just went with it. Um, and then that first year of hobby growing from fall 2019 into the summer of 2020, it just lit a passion and a love for everything about that. And then in late fall of 2020, I was like, this is what I want to do. 
And that's when I decided I'm going to make this a business. And I just dove straight in and haven't looked back and awesome. loved every second of it. That's awesome. So how, so since is your home part of a neighborhood or is it, um, you know, cause I don't even know how much land you have and that you're growing on. I have half an acre and that okay. includes the house and the outbuilding. So I'd probably say that a quarter acre is the amount that I'm able to grow on. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the older neighborhoods. So, you know, built in the 1970s, it's a private road off of a main road. All of the properties have about a quarter to half an acre. So, and it's pretty urban, like we're five minutes off the freeway. Sure. And so, you know, one of my things that I always wonder about is, um, since now, you know, you're trying to do this as a business, uh, what were those kind of baby steps? Like, how, what did you look to do? How do you move your flowers? Um, you know, I'm kind of curious how that all played out. Yeah. So I've had to, I have four kids and we homeschool them. So centering everything around the home was really important to me from the beginning, trying to make both the family life and the business, um, work. So I've, um, cultivated, a market around that. So I have a flower stand at the end of my driveway. Um, that's how I move flowers. But then as my Instagram grew, um, I had other opportunities as well. Education is something I'm super passionate about and I love to do. But I also grow a lot of dahlias to sell the tubers right now. And honestly, you know, and I like a little like a side um, topic, like moving from a hobby to a business, I found you have to be extremely practical about what you grow. You have to be really smart about what you grow. You can't just grow something because you like it. You have to grow it because it's something that sells. And the smaller your property, the more true that is. And that's something that, um, not to brag, but I actually am very, very good at being very practical when I need to be. Um, I'm very obsessive about flowers and, you know, I grow some just for me, but in terms of like business choices, I approach everything from a very like logical, um, how do I maximize the amount I can make in the space that I have? So I grow, um, very high value flowers. Oh, okay. I mean, that's, that's what I was trying to understand because I feel like a lot of times people do get bogged down in certain crops that I'm like, why are you growing that? Because, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I feel like, um, I know we had someone that was growing some baby's breath and, and I just think number you can one, find it anywhere. well, yeah, you can find it anywhere, but also you really, if you're going to grow it, it's got to be the most beautiful, right. You know, in the universe. And it's, um, and it wasn't, and, and I felt bad for them and, you know, it's tough, but it's like, really, it's, it's about, it's about sort of how much money can you make per square foot? And I think it's really amazing that you can, you know, prioritize that well, because I feel like sometimes our, our flower loving emotions get in the way of that. So, yeah, yeah. for sure. I mean, and, and mine do, um, for example, roses are actually like a really good event flower, but that's something I have chosen not to do because of my kids and it's a lot of work to do events. I still have like 150 to 200 rose bushes because I love roses and someday I'll do events and then they'll be great. I love that. So when it comes to roses, you, you have that many bushes. How many varieties do you have? Um, oh man, uh, probably 40 or 50. Um, so my whole front yard used to be this long and I, I converted it into a cottage garden. So I used the roses as like the main shrubs in each plot, roses and peonies. And then I interplant them with like lots of flowers that I can also use for cuts. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my way of doing it to kind of like combine beauty without, um, not that there's not beauty in long straight rows of flowers, but 
to make it more interesting, I enjoy the diversified planting. It's not efficient for harvesting though. Like I'll just put that out there. It's way more efficient to have rows. But in my back is where I do like long rows of flowers. Um, so. Sure, sure. Yeah. So do you um, find, is growing roses up in the Pacific Northwest easy or hard? Because I mean, with all the rain, I would be concerned about the moisture and disease and things like that. You have to pick the right varieties. Like, I find like that's where people usually have the biggest issue is they're just buying whatever catches their eye. And that is one area where I am very practical. Uh, like any rose I buy has to be rated as having a high disease resistance. I always go for ones that bloom more than once and they have sure. to smell good. And I usually get the David Austin ones, which are grown in a similar climate to mine because England is actually has a pretty similar um climate and rainfall yeah that makes perfect sense i hadn't thought of it that way but um and that's a great idea looking for areas of the world that are similar in climate and see what does well do you are there a lot of rose growers up near you or in your area that you can also see kind of like what they're growing not really um i mean i know a lot of farms who grow roses but like actually have full-scale rose farms i don't think there are any up here yeah Um, yeah it's, I mean, part of that is, you know, I, ideally you want to be in a climate that's more like California so that you can get like the maximum production value out of your roses. But here, you know, we, our roses, depending on what varieties you have, they bloom May through July or May, May through August. And that's a pretty short growing season um, if you're thinking of selling them. Yeah. Well, and I think too, you've got to find roses that can handle a lot of overcast days uh, Mm -hmm. and not full sun and things like that up there. And, and, and that makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, Any varieties that are your favorites as far as maybe how they produce? Oh yeah. So my top favorite right now is um, Eustacea Vi, which is a relatively new David Austin introduction, super prolific um flower it's kind of a peachy coral pink which is my favorite color right now um and the disease resistance is high like super high and it's also bred to do really well in part shade so i have these two-year-old bushes and they're massive like they're just huge um and i got let me think like each one i would say like a two-year-old bush so this isn't even considered fully mature Like this year, each one produced 20 or 30 stems. And um, that's the rose I have the most of because I love it so much. Um, I have eight of them. So like that one's pretty high on the list. Well, I'm kind of curious. You said now, as far as your season, I know you're talking about roses blooming. I think you said roughly May through August or something. I'm curious, uh, do you try to produce cuts year round or are you primarily, you know, within the season? Um, I don't try and produce them year round, but I do overwinter a lot. So ranunculus and um, tulips, ranunculus more than tulips because I love ranunculus and um, they're they're actually kind of hard to find because they're a little tricky to grow. Um, but I overwinter those in low tunnels. So usually I'm getting flowers mid-March is like the earliest. And then because I succession plant the ranunculus, the ranunculus go into June, depending upon our weather. So I focus very heavily on the spring season. Um, and like, that's my primary focus. And then I've switched tracks Last year, I did the whole summer market as well. Um, I switched tracks this year and decided to cut that out until mid-August and then do mainly dahlias. And that was just a family choice. Like it was just too much on my kids and the family to be working so much during the entire summer. So that's what I've moved into. It's like a very heavy spring focus and then sell dahlias like dahlia cuts later. And then through those other months, I will supply to other florist farmers that I know. And then I sell the tubers as well. Okay. So, so besides the farm stand that you have, 
you also sell at the or you sell to florists or farmer florists mm -hmm. and the two birds okay well that makes sense so what other sort of high value crops do you grow besides those the peonies and the roses and the dahlias you know i grow a lot of snapdragons and other things to like fill in bouquets but my backbone really are dahlias ranunculus tulips and peonies um and i find that that is also kind of an essential part of growing on a smaller space is when you try and grow too many of crops you don't have enough so i i've really tried to narrow in on some and then grow those really well and um I found that that works really well, actually. Yeah, I like that point because uh, I I totally get that. And it's interesting because some of the farms I've spoken with and have visited, even big farms are starting to do this. And it's not because of the numbers. It's just because you it, it's it's almost more time consuming to grow all these different varieties because you have all these different needs and you have all these you know, different routines and things like that. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but I can imagine being a micro farm, you, it's even a bigger deal because you're trying to provide some kind of volume and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's too hard when you don't have the numbers to really make sense for you. Yeah, um, exactly. Or even growing too many varieties of one flower. So last year I grew 800 dahlias but it was like 300 varieties so you're almost at like you know between one to three plants and I quickly found that I hated that first of all you never have like if you were selling to a florist you never have enough of one to put in a bunch and second of all when it goes to digging up and dividing it actually takes like five times as long because you have to tag every separate one instead of like a whole row so this year, that was something I changed. I went for between 10 to 60 of a variety. And this year I'm growing 2,500, but it's still around 300 varieties or a little bit less actually. Okay, so that's still a lot of dahlias. Um, yeah. <laughs> especially when you consider your growing space. Um, do you find that because you're growing so much of this similar product on a small space, you know, over the past few years, are you having any different insect pressure or any other disease pressure just because you can't rotate things around as much? You know, I haven't. Um, I focus very heavily on soil health and I think that that makes a huge difference. So I would say that like primarily the soil is my focus. And then in some ways I am rotating crops because as soon as the dahlias go out, ranunculus go in. So there is a rotation there. But um, honestly, with companion planting, which is something I actually do in my dahlia fields and um, prioritizing the bird population, which I think is just, if you're gonna do organic farming is absolutely key in helping manage your pests. I haven't seen a lot of um, widespread issues. I mean, I would say that my biggest problem is thrips mm. um, for dahlias. And, um, but those can just kind of blow in on the wind. Like you could like have no thrips on your field and the next day you have thrips just because they just blow in on a wind um, depending on the weather. And that's a main issue for me because uh, thrips are uh, number one pest disease vector for dahlias and um, virus is something that the dahlia world cares a lot about. So um, those are ones I keep an eye on. Sure. For sure. I'm, I'm curious, since you mentioned companion planting, like what things do you try to utilize for that? So the main one that I do on a very large scale are alliums because they repel aphids. And ever since I started doing like drumstick alliums, so, you know, like the tiny bulbs, so they fit in really well into your fields or your garden. They don't like really compete. Um, I almost never see an aphid now on my property. 
And I know I have ladybugs, but I don't have that many ladybugs. I've actually never bought in ladybugs. Um, so I do alliums everywhere. And then the other one that I do a lot of are marigolds because those repel um, like ear, well, they're actually a trap crop for earwigs, which, you know, everyone has issues with earwigs and dahlias. So I underplant all my dahlias with dwarf marigolds and the earwigs just go for those and leave my dahlias alone. So those are the two main ones that I do. Wow, that's interesting. And do you, well. sorry? It works pretty well. Um, I, I know I always like to use marigolds for different reasons like that, but I never heard about allium. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and plus you can cut the stem if you want to oh, do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I use them all the time actually, so. How long is the season on the allium? Because I know, I feel like they are sort of, they bloom and then they're done, but then I know their presence can still have some impact. Um, the drumstick alliums, so they start blooming. Let me try and think here. Like if we have a normal weather year, which, you know, do we ever anymore? But anyway, um, like beginning to mid June. And then if you don't cut them, they'll just stay there and the bees and the pollinators will be all over them through like mid August before they really die. Mm. Um, and honestly, like that's the time when aphids really show up. It's like the early um, spring. Yeah, there's a lot of pest pressure that time of year. So if yeah. you can, if you have a friend that helps that time of year, that's, that's awesome. Um, do you find that, um, you know, obviously, I was thinking back to when you were talking about converting your front yard um, and you're getting rid of sod or you're getting rid of, you know, lawn. Um, do you, what techniques do you use to kind of get rid of that? Because I know there's a lot of people out there, including myself, that would love to conquer that battle without using any kind of spray. So I actually just mowed it really short or weed whacked it short. I did both because, you know, a mower will only get so much. So I weed whacked it like down to the ground and then I sheet mulched it with cardboard and then I built beds with compost on top about like two to three inches. Um, and I did that in the fall, which if you're going to do that method, I do recommend doing in the fall because it just gives time for the worms to incorporate the compost into your native soil. Um, other people I know do a one-time till and then they build uh, like beds on top of that. That wasn't an option for me because I'm urban. It was my front lawn. I have electricity wires. I have internet wires. I have water lines. Like I had the county come out and mark where everything was and it was like all over. And I'm like, there's, I'm not, I'm not going to risk telling and <laughs> make the whole neighborhood mad. <laughs> um, so that was my approach. Other people do a sob remover, but oh. I didn't want to do that because one of the things that a lot of people don't think about when you're urban, but it, it's true is we don't have a lot of ways to get rid of landscape waste. Like we literally get one landscape bin every two weeks, which is not enough. Um, so you have to find a way to cart it out. And that's difficult. Well, plus I think so, too, so many times that removes some of the healthiest, most yeah. uh, rich part of your soil doing that. I mean, even though a sod remover is not that deep, but but then all those roots act as little aerators that as they break down and, you know, adds more of richness to your soil. So I can right. totally see where that's, that's a win-win doing it that way. Um, and I, I can appreciate that. So do you find, um, since a lot of the property, you know, was lawn at one point, do you use, uh, do you have any grass at all in your property that you maintain like in between rows or do you use mulches? And then what do you use if you use mulches? Pretty minimal grass. I'd say that at this point, we have approximately 200 square feet of actual lawn. Um, and I am forbidden from touching that because. <laughs> um, and then we had another like probably 
you know, 600 square feet that was our septic field, which you're not supposed to dig into, but I've converted, I've put, um, if you see my Instagram, bulb crates all over that. Um, oh, so that's that area. I have noticed yeah, that. That's what that area is. That's why I use them. Um, people ask me, it's like, that's so cool. Like, is it better than growing in ground? I'm like, no, it's not better than growing in ground. I'd still prefer to grow in ground, but I can't dig into the ground there. And this is a way to utilize, utilize that space. So, um, I mean, it works pretty well, but you know, anything in a pot is going to be slightly higher maintenance. Oh, anything. sure. Sure. So, and do you, uh, what crops, what crops do you grow in the crates? Um, in the spring I do tulips. So if you go back far enough on my Instagram, you'll see a point where we had a heat wave and all the tulips just bloomed and oh, well, <laughs> you know, can't be harvested at that point, really. Um, and then right now I'm doing dahlias in them. So it gives me some extra space for dahlias and like property that I wouldn't normally be able to grow on. I use a lot of um, wood chips for paths, like in my front, that's what all the paths are. They're wood chips. Um, my field paths are so tiny. Like people would be absolutely, any farmer would be totally horrified at the size of my paths because I 100% sacrifice convenience for the ability to have more flowers. So my paths are literally wide enough for me, which, you know, is a problem because that means people can't really help me. So they're pretty much just dirt or their wood chips or their um, mulch. But I try not to do grass because they're so small that I, like a mower couldn't even get down there, you know, it, You'd have right. to weed whack and then you risk getting the actual crops. So that's kind of what I do. Well, how many extra rows do you get in your property having such small rows? Well, so like my main dahlia field is, I'm trying to do the math here. It's 16 feet by 70 feet. And my paths, I have one, two, three, four. I have four beds across that. And my paths are between eight inches and 13 inches. So you're so, literally going down these paths sideways at probably mm -hmm. late August. Mm -hmm. It's like shimmy down. <laughs> to be honest, it works because I keep them cut. Like if you were going to, I keep my fields like very harvested. If you were going to grow dahlias like that and you wanted them to bloom and you want to look beautiful, I would absolutely say do not do that because you'd have a total jungle. Um, but I keep mine pretty chopped down, except for when I'm going through like, you know, I let them all bloom in August because you have to ID, you have to um, photograph all of them if you're selling tubers, but I keep them pretty cut. Well, and I think that's one thing that people forget, or they're not aggressive enough cutting, which yeah. only helps the stems become longer, but you have to not be afraid to, to make a serious cut on the plant and, um, it, it'll help you in the long run, plus help produce, you know, more flowers. I'm, I'm curious when it comes to roses, um, you said most of those, cause obviously those are permanent. Those are there all the time. Um, do you find... Uh, what's the spacing like on those being that, you know, you, you're trying to keep everything tight. So my front, um, yard, not a yard garden, they have bigger paths. So I would, I made all of the paths. I actually, this is literally how I made the paths. I put a wheelbarrow down and I measured and like, that was the, the width of the path was whatever I could get a wheelbarrow down. So those ones have bigger paths that wasn't really, it was designed more with the intention of um, just beauty and a little bit less for practicality because you just can't do it all. Like I absolutely could, you know, maximize my front and just like have rows of tight dahlias, but they're, you know, I like diversity. So I don't always let logic win in my uh, field plants. I love that. So well, those I... ones are wider. Go ahead. Those ones are wider and then it, the whole front, I basically divided it up into, I think, 20 smaller beds. 
So the, the entire front is around 6,000 square feet. I have like one big border along the outside that like borders the road. And then the inside is like 20 smaller beds. And then I basically plan each of those beds as like little gardens. So each bed has like maybe two or three roses in it. And then I interplant them with some other perennials. And then I fill in the spaces every year with annuals. Okay. And like that's how I build them up. Where uh, being up there, I'm kind of curious. Do you, when you're sourcing your roses, how, where do you get most of them, or is it just kind of everywhere? I actually usually order them online. So I order them from David Austin, which has a um, like a U.S. plant in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other one that I use a lot is heirloom roses, mm -hmm. which actually going back is actually a big rose farm, but it's in Oregon. And, um, the way that Oregon and Washington climates work, it's actually a completely different type of climate than what I'm in. It's a lot drier. It's a little bit more like California. So those are the two main places I get them from. Yeah. I'm amazed at how many different roses they have. The heirloom oh, yeah. rose people. I mean, it's insane. All the different ones. Um, I know. I'm. I'm kind of hoping next year to get some for myself because, um, I, I have mentioned this on the podcast before, but I had visited a trial garden in Athens and saw all these varieties that did really well in our heat and our humidity. And I thought, oh, I've got to get some of these to play with. Um, and they had yeah. them all. They had every variety that I was looking for. Um, I'm curious. Uh. Do you, with that small space and your tight turnaround times, do you ever use cover crops at all in anything that you do? Um, cover cropping, you know, honestly, I never, I rarely have the space to do it. Um, I have to flip beds so quickly to a productive crop to another productive crop that I honestly almost never have time to cover crop. I will do it if like, say, you know, it's midsummer. There's not enough time to grow another one because of like the season window. I'll cover crop that bed instead of leaving it empty. So, and I'll do like buckwheat or mustard. But other than that, you know, my dahlias and like all my summer flowers go out and then it's just immediately filled with ranunculus and tulips and hardy annuals for spring. So some people consider that a form of cover cropping because you're not leaving the soil bare, but like traditional, you know, oats, peas, um, all that, I rarely have time. And I wish I did, but I don't. Like, there's just not enough time. I just have to flip to flip. And when you flip, so then, since you can't do that, which I totally, it makes perfect sense, um, are you just adding compost every time? Or what you said, soil is one of your main focuses. What do you do when you're doing such high intensity growing in such a small area? And it's 12 months a year production, pretty much. What do you do to kind of help that soil health? So, yes, that is definitely something I think about a lot. Um, I'm very fortunate in having a local place who makes extremely high quality compost. Um, and it's not, I always have to feel like I have to caveat this. It's not manure compost. I mean, I call it like vegan compost because it's like, um, leaves and wood chips and like landscape material that's all composted down. Um, so I will bulk order that in every year, every two years. And I usually have a pile sitting in my driveway. And then when I flip a bed, I'll um, top dress it with about like half an inch to an inch at this point, now that I've like built up my soil and then I'll immediately plant into it. So yeah, every time I flip, I'm usually putting on like a thin layer of compost, immediately planting in. And so far that's worked really well. Like I don't actually use fertilizers hardly at all. Um, I haven't found a need for them. So um, yeah, that's what I do instead of the cover cropping. Well, I, I think that's interesting because since you're getting that, um, I love that, that the vegan um, compost, um, you, you know, you don't have to worry probably about burning things and things, you know, it's, it's a different beast, um, altogether, which I think is great. I mean, I think that's a good, it's a good way to go. I, uh, often wonder too, when you're doing that, I mean, here in the South, 
a lot of times when I would add compost, it takes so long for it to actually kind of penetrate down deep. Um, because you don't till, because you don't have that, I mean, do you feel like you have a really great depth of of quality soil, or is it still pretty much um, shallow? Yeah, I probably should have added it in the note that I brought fork it in. Okay. No, yeah. yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll top dress it, and then I'll just like broad fork down the row, and then I'll plant into it. But yeah, um, my worm population seems to be very, very good. So they will quickly mix it in for me. Um, and my native soil is actually like, like just not pure sand, but it's pretty darn close to like pure sand um, because the very original owner thought it was a great idea to bulldoze away all the topsoil. Oh, wow. So I don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> But um, my native soil, it's like so easy to dig into. It's very, very sandy. So adding in that compost, like I added in a lot in the first few years just because I needed to build up that soil structure um, from, for something that would actually like hold moisture. Even. Sure, sure. And I'm kind of curious. So when you, I know I want to go back to your market bouquets for a second. When you're growing the way you're growing, are are you doing mixed bunches at all? Or are they pretty much just solid bunches of ranunculus or roses or or oh no. Most of them are mixed. Yeah. Okay. Um that's I find that's a little bit easier to do in the spring than the summer though. Like I, I would say that that is a problem with growing on such a small piece of property is that it is harder to get those um like that variety of flowers you need for like a good bouquet in the summertime. So, um, but spring, like I said, spring is my focus. I feel like pouring a lot of my energy and my um, thought into that to making that really high quality has worked pretty well. But yeah, I will do straight bunches, but I would describe it as like, that's a fourth of what I do. And I usually do market bouquets, mixed market bouquets. What's been one of the hardest things about farming the way you do? Um, space. The like I make the paths work, but I'm definitely reaching the point where I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and then um, you can't have any type of equipment. Like mm -hmm. I literally, well, prob. I mean, there would just be be absolutely zero point in having a tractor like zero, like it just would not add any value at all. So all of the like wood chips and the compost and everything I've just moved by wheelbarrow, which is super like great workout. Yay me. <laughs> but um, when my brother-in-law tells me that he moved 20 cubic yards of dirt in 30 minutes with his tractor, I'm like, please don't talk to me right now. <laughs> Oh my gosh. That, yeah, that, that's gotta hurt a little bit. Yeah. So now, you know, it's more of like, uh, I used to be like super excited when I get the piles and now I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's 12 gotta... cubic yards is 72 wheelbarrows. I now know this. <laughs> okay. So anyone doing math out there and you're wondering, yeah, I love that. Yeah. 72 wheelbarrows. Whew. Yep. Wow. Full wheelbarrows. You got to fill them up to the top. <laughs> and drop a little compost along the way. So yeah. I love that. Um, do you, uh, I know you mentioned earlier about the birds and helping your, you know, with insects and things like that. Um, I know earlier you mentioned birds helping insect populations. I'm wondering, do you, uh, and you mentioned ladybugs, do you introduce any beneficials into your property? You know, actually I haven't, um, I, I'm not absolutely not against it. And, you know, there was probably points at which I should have, but I just found that like organically growing the farm and just planting so much like diversity of plantings has just brought them all in. So I actually find it so fun now because every year I see new varieties of beneficial insects. I'm like, oh, this year we got dragonflies. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, 
so I just haven't found a need, but I mean, yeah, I would have. Sure. No, I understand. Um, I'm kind of curious if, uh, I know right now there is a big trend for no-till and I know you've talked about some of the benefits and so, and that's, that was your only choice because you just couldn't fit equipment and get areas you couldn't disturb. And I'm kind of curious, um, we haven't really talked about that in a while on our podcast and I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts about it, your insights, the benefits of it. Um, obviously, I think a lot of people feel like they can't do that. But if you're on a smaller property, I feel like it's easier almost than you know, if you're on a huge property. So I'd love to learn more about how that has helped you and kind of the steps you've taken to maintain that. Or is there anything different you do besides obviously not bring a tiller? So no-till by, um, the whole point of no-till is to preserve your soil structure. And um, one of the biggest benefits of it is that when you do till and there's, you know, I personally think that there's space for that. Like, I think there's space for a lot of different ways of farming, but one of the issues with tilling, which anybody who tills will recognize is that you are bringing up all your buried weed seeds. So every year your weed pressure is going to be the same and it's going to be the same and then it's going to be a lot. Um, and then if you end up heaven forbid, tilling something that has invasives, you just made your problem way worse because, you know, invasives usually are spread by like little pieces of root. So, you know, you till up a field of bindweed and guess what? You just multiplied your bindweed. Um, so, you know, that's like the downside of tilling and no-till um, basically it gets past that. So you will still have weed pressure with no-till, but each year, the idea is that it gets less and less um, because you're not, you know, tilling up all the buried weed seeds, any weed seeds that are coming in or being ones that are dropped by birds or just blown in by the wind. And I found that to be true. It's like my oldest no-till beds, the weed pressure is um, very small. And then the other benefit of it is because um, your soil isn't getting super compacted because the concept of no-till is also to keep your soil covered. So whether that's mulches, whether that's plants, that prevents erosion, um, which makes your soil like nice, soft, and fluffy. It's actually so easy to pull out any weeds you do have. So that's like a very practical benefit of it. And it was one of the things that actually drew me to no-till in the first place, because um, as I've mentioned before, I have kids, like I have to balance. So less time spent weeding, yay. But, you know, then there's the benefits of just the soil, like how it benefits the soil and how it preserves microbes and microorganisms and like stuff you're not destroying. Um, I think it is actually way easier to do on a smaller scale than a large scale. If you're going to go the somewhat traditional way of, you know, sheet mulching or using a silage tarp to kill off the grass or the weeds and then adding in compost because the larger area you have, like the more um, expense that is, because rarely can somebody actually make enough compost to do that. So there are, <clears throat> I would say like hybrid no-till ways where you till mm -hmm. once and then you, you work with the native soil and the cover crops to build up your soil. Um, like it's cheaper, but slower. So like there's different ways to do it. And if I ever had a really big property, I probably would do that just from a, like a financial standpoint. Like I probably, what I do is I like soil test, do a one-time till, amend it, and then just build from there. Because like sheet mulching is a ton of work. Like it was a ton of work on 6,000 square feet. Like if you were trying to do an acre of that, it would, that'd be a lot. Yeah, it would be. Um, the, I would mention though that I feel like there is a con of it and I feel like as no-till has become more popular that I'm seeing this crop up more and more and that um, bad compost is a thing. Mm. And if you're going to go down the no-till route, you really got to know what's in the compost if you're buying it in. Um, I'm super fortunate. The company I get from it tests it three times. I've talked to them. I know their exact process. 
I know it's super high quality, but I've heard horror stories from people who bought it and it was just like loaded with salt or it was just crappy. Like it just had like no nutritional value at all. So like that would just be my one caveat is like, if you're going to go down this road, like be so annoying in your questions to who you're, when you're buying it, because there's almost nothing worse than getting a bad load of soil. Right. Because sometimes it can, I mean, I know I've shared this, it's been a long time ago, but, um, uh, we had a grower in Georgia that got a bad load of compost and it basically ruined that summer's production because uh -huh. it had, um, it had Roundup in it basically. Uh -huh. Yep. And and Roundup, if you read the, the chemical guide for it, you know, it says it breaks down in two weeks. Well, we all know it doesn't. And so it um it had a it had a lasting impact. Yeah. Um so I'm curious, like, so what are the questions? What are the questions you ask? Because I agree, I feel like you should I mean, this is your 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 babies you're planting into them. Um, this is, this is your livelihood. What do you look for? What is, you know, I'm just curious what some of those questions are. So the biggest question that I ask is how do you ensure that there's no herbicide? There's no latent herbicide in the compost because, and that's actually one of the reasons why I don't get manure compost at all, because just the, the chance of that being in there is like so high. Because really? Almost, why? Because um, almost all hay crops are sprayed with a herbicide because it gets rid of a certain weed that's poisonous to animals. Um, that's an invasive weed and that will stay in the straw. And depending upon what animal eats it, um, not animals all break down um, what they eat to the full extent. And then it just stays in. Like I actually know somebody who, a, a more small scale grower, but she ordered in, she got like this, what was supposed to be high quality um, bagged soil and it was laced with grazon, which is a broadleaf herbicide. And her her dahlia season is pretty much like maybe they'll recover by towards the end, but you know, it, the herbicide damage on them is noticeable and it's bad. And that can stay in the soil for like three years. So I would always just say like, unless you actually keep the animals yourself, or you know that where you're getting manure is like organically fed and they never, you know, feed them with stuff treated with herbicide, like just steer clear of that. Um, you mean, you can do like a quick test actually by it just uh, sowing beans or peas because they're so fast growing. So if you wanted to see if it was good, you just sow that into it and it, you'd be able to tell pretty quick if it has it. Hmm. That's a good, that's so a good always, idea. I always ask about herbicide um, because, you know, people spray stuff. And then I ask if they do soil tests on the nutritional content and what their policies are about accepting um, like woody products that have been treated with chemicals or heavy metals or, you know, because like there's stuff like railroad ties, which are like pumped full of all the things that you don't want. Right. Um, so, and, and usually at least the places around here do not accept those because of the chemical um, load. But those are the questions I ask is like herbicide is number one. Yeah, I love that. Um, I know that a lot of times, uh, I know we were talking about this earlier, but I'd kind of like to go back to it. I feel like, when flower farmers or or hobbyists and they're and they're trying to either make some extra bucks or maybe they're really good at growing a handful of things or or they're trying to uh take i don't know i, I guess i hear sometimes where people don't go into fl growing flowers for sale as a business because they feel like they have to have five acres they feel like they have to have one acre they feel like they have to have you know um, a certain amount or kind of land in order to be profitable on it. And I, I think it's great that we have so many people interested in it, but I don't know. I feel like because of what you do and the way you do it, I'm curious 
um, if we could talk a little deeper on, on, on really making a business out of it and being mm-hmm. profitable about it. I mean, I think you have to be really smart about what you're growing. And like, this is where, you know, I'm going to like let the practicality and the logic take over. Um, it's not all about the money for me, but as a business woman, when I think about my business, it's like, this is a business. It has to be profitable. It has to make money. I do think about things in terms of like, okay, what is my financial output? Um, one of the reasons, I mean, I love them or one of my favorite flowers, but one of the business reasons why I've switched to um, prioritizing Dahlia tubers is because that is a viable way on a small property to make money and be profitable. Um, You have to know how to grow them. You have to know how to divide them. There's like too many newer farms out there who don't know how to divide and they're sending out blind tubers. Like that's going to kill your business real quick. Like you have to be dedicated to quality no matter what you do. Um, But, you know, one tuber and a plant is going to make between five to eight tubers. Um, Say you sell only five of those um, and say you even do you know, a smaller number, um, like some tubers go now for $40, but let's just, you know, average it out at $12 for those five tubers. That's a $60 plant. So, um, and I don't mind talking numbers. So last year I actually kept track of how much, how many hours I worked on tubers and, and like, you know, from planting to growing, to dividing, to maintaining, like I just kept track of all of my hours. Um, and then when I sold them, you know, all the expenses. So I kept track of all my hours, all my expenses. Um, and at the end of that season, it came to $36 an hour, which was the amount that I made from an Mm. hourly. Um, and then, uh, so that was like 800 tubers. And I think my profit after that, I'm trying to remember. I have a post on it if people dig far enough back, but it was around 30,000 from 800 tubers. Wow. So to me, last year was kind of a test year because uh, tubers are a lot of work. Like it's very time intensive. It's literally like a year round crop because, you know, in the winter, people are like, oh, you have time off. I was like, no, we're dividing, we're storing, we're making sure they don't rot, um, all of that. But when I think in terms of my space um, and something that I enjoy doing, so like those are the two things I look for is like, do I enjoy growing this flower, which I do. So that will make it, you know, the hard times worth it. Um, But the return is higher. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to put my energy into that because that's a better business decision than say, you know, growing sunflowers which Hmm. yes, you absolutely can sell, but your season is much shorter and your reach is only those people who are around you. Now I know other farmers who do just market bouquets. They just focus in on that. They do a fabulous job. They definitely have a profitable business, Um, but that is more consistent labor, like consistent, a lot of labor year round one of my decisions was I was looking for some things like, yes, it's a ton of work, but it is actually intensified into certain months of the year. So this is something that I could make work with my kids. Like mom is not working the same, you know, heavy amount all the time. She is working a lot, but it's centered in on a few months of the year when I'm really working like eight to 10 hour days instead of like year long. Right. Right. Another one is peonies. I think people overlook peonies is actually a very valuable crop. Um, The downside is that there's like a time investment and a money investment on the front end, because ideally you don't really want to cut from a peony until it's like four years old. But once a peony is mature, it makes between, you know, 20 to 40 stems. Say you sell only 20 of those at like a $5, like that would be like a retail amount. Well, that's a hundred dollars for a plant. I mean, if I wanted to convert my property to peonies, I could easily fit three to 4,000 plants on it if I just wanted to do peonies. 
So that right there, you know, on a quarter acre of growing space is like, sorry, I'm trying to do the math. All right, three thousand hundred dollars a plant. Yeah, it's 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 a chunk of change. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think that if you want to actually make a living, like an actual living, like you can live off of this, off of a property my size, you have to be pretty open to diversifying. Like, I don't think that I could actually make. No, actually, I do. Um, sorry. I no judging like based off of my number of projections, I do actually think I would make a living when I sell all the dahlia tubers that I'm growing next year. But if you didn't want to grow that much and you just diversified, so like I have three um, main prongs right now. I focus heavily on spring flowers. Like spring flowers are probably my favorite flowers. So like how much I love them is worth all the work. And that's also the easiest market to sell because everybody just wants flowers in spring. So I focus heavily on spring flowers. I do education because I found out that I really love that. I really love helping people, um, you know, transform their spaces and to learn how to grow. And then I do dahlia tubers. So those are like my three streams of income. And that's what I found works well for my family. Yeah. But I probably could just do dahlia tubers if I wanted to. So do you, I know we recently had an episode where we were talking about dahlias and one of the things that came up is, and I don't know if this, I hear this issue might be more prevalent than I know is, is viruses and disease and things like that. Um, do you, any particular steps you take in, in to prevent that kind of situation? Because especially if you're selling tubers, if that's a big part of your business, um, you know, that's, that's a legitimate concern for a lot of people. Yeah, that's probably my number one stress. And I would just say that I don't believe that it's possible to eradicate virus in any plant. And I think that is something that people overlook is that it's not just dahlias that have virus. Right. And any plant in your garden can have virus. It's not like, you know, you never see a sick plant and you take care of it. People are really like honed in on dahlias right now because, um, you know, it's a valid concern. So I do a couple things. One is I cull very aggressively. So I've educated myself on what virus signs are. Um, I test randomly in my field. It's not financially feasible to test everything. Sure. Uh, if you tested, I ran the numbers on this. It's like if I tested all 2,500 plants, one time for each of the common viruses, it's around a hundred thousand dollars for mm. one time. Wow. And you can't test one time because pests can bring in disease. So really you would want to be testing like three or four or five times. Like that's just not, I defy anyone who says that's sustainable. <laughs> yeah. That would not be sustainable for anyone. <laughs> um, so I think that the way that growers should be going is you know, is doing your best to create virus tolerant plants. Like viruses, sorry, dahlia tolerant. You know what I mean? Dahlias that tolerate virus. Because tests from the ADS show that like 80% of dahlias have a virus. But not all of them show that, they're asymptomatic. So what you really wanna be doing is you wanna be encouraging those plants that probably have a virus, but you would never know from looking at it because it's so healthy and robust. And part of that process is you cull or throw out any plant that has symptoms of virus. So that's what I do. And I just have to turn my brain off at that point. Like it's usually like, this is the time that I'm culling because I cull plants that were expensive. Like I have 100% bought, you know, $35 tubers grows, I call it. So I just turn my brain off about the varieties or how hard I worked for that yeah. thing. And I'm just like, yeah, out it goes. <laughs> um, and then I sanitize between my plants um, because the two ways viruses usually are spread are either by a wound. So like that's cutting a plant or by a pest. 
And then um, the number one pest vector for disease in valleys is thrips. So I actually, that is the one pest that early on in the season, I do use an organic pesticide on. And I will caveat this, I know that organic pesticides also target pollinators, but I do think that there is a space to use them very carefully that minimizes or makes that not affect them. So I will primarily, I pretty much only spray for thrips early in the season before there are any flowers. So there are no pollinators even attracted to these plants. This is the, like the main time when I cull. And this is mostly to ensure that the thrips are not spreading virus that might be coming up from like new tubers I bought to other plants before I can catch it. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody's listening to this and they want to do it, I pick a no wind day. So no wind. So there's no likelihood that the spray is going to be, you know, headed off somewhere. And I'll put my sprayer like right next to the plant. So I'm just getting the plant. And like I stress, I do this before there are flowers. Like, trust me, I absolutely love pollinators. I do not want to harm them. But I found that that is honestly an essential part of my maintenance um, process because last year I did not do that. I had some dahlias came, come in with a virus that spreads very easily. And I ended up throwing out a full quarter of my stock because wow. thrips were spreading it. Like thrips had come in on other plants. Thrips were spreading it like faster than I could cull for them. So, you know, I would just say like, if you're a grower who doesn't want to spray, you're going to have to be prepared to cull a lot more than maybe you would have. Yeah, it's probably be very vigilant as far as looking for the signs and um, trying to to remove those plant materials you know as quick as possible yeah um, I know that one of the people I know like they have a burn pile and they'll burn stuff like that because they're just throwing it on the compost bin sometimes yeah. only keeps it uh, going so you have to be oh, careful yeah. with that yeah I threw totally. mother tubers into my compost and like oh you're growing man all the care I take in preserving you and you're just I'm just gonna grow a bloom over here that's right whether you like it or not um yeah that's awesome well uh you know I always like to end our episodes with an advice question and you've given some really good points and advice and I'm curious if there's anything you'd love to leave with our listeners that maybe has meant a lot to you or something you'd just like to share um you know and I think that this might be a little controversial but um if you can grow your farm and um well first of all you do not need as much property as you think you need and second of all grow with as little debt as possible mm. because that means that when failures hit um just the just the physical stress is not going to be as high so that's like a that's how i have grown mine um I, I hate financial stress. It's like latent from childhood. So I do my best to avoid it. Um, but I would say, you know, test a lot of things, figure out the stuff you love, and then really lean into that. Well, I love that. And I especially love the no debt situation or the best you can with that, because you're right, there's enough stress uh, and just dealing with Mother Nature and all the curveballs that come our way, uh, adding a lot of debt is one of those things that is just makes it even worse. And so, um, but yeah, I can appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being on the Flower Podcast. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, Scott. I have been like watching your podcast for a long time. I was like, oh, he asked me. I'm so excited. 